Yeah, I'm ready. The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So in keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. Therefore, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew 5:20 For I tell you unless your righteousness exceeds that of the experts in the law and the Pharisees you will never enter the kingdom of heaven Now what it means here it's saying that your righteousness must exceed self-righteousness the Pharisees the Sadducees the scribes Pharisees and hypocrites all of them were very self-righteous and they thought they were going to heaven because of all the great things they were doing in life. They thought they're going to heaven because, well, they follow the Mosaic law to a T. And they think that because of that, they're going to heaven. But what Christ says is, no, they're not. Your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. Your righteousness must exceed that of the experts in the law. And how is our righteousness going to exceed that of the Pharisees? Simply by believing in Christ. Because when we believe in Christ, we are imputed with the righteousness of God. Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was credited to his account for what? Righteousness. So we have righteousness when we believe in Christ. And it's that same righteousness that God has. And that's how you get into heaven, by having a God's righteousness. The only way to do so is to believe in Christ. So the only way to exceed the self-righteousness of the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, of those who are experts in the law, is to believe in Christ. And th at that point, you will possess the righteousness of God. And you do not possess the righteousness of God because of how you act, because of your morality, because you follow the Mosaic law. You are saved because you've simply believed in Christ, and that's given to us throughout all of Scripture, such as John 3.15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life, not by being self-righteous, but simply by believing in Christ. John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. John 3.18 He who believes in him, Jesus Christ, is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. And notice in this verse, the word believe is repeated three times. Nothing else added to it. So what Christ is saying is, you must believe in him. What he's saying is, look, not even the Pharisees, not even the experts in the law go to heaven simply because they are experts in the law. They go to heaven because they believed in Christ. They're not going to heaven because they act so moral. They're not going to heaven because they act so self-righteous. They're not going to heaven because they can look out over uh, the land and say, uh, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like all of these other people who commit sins. They, too, commit sins, and we will see that in detail as we go through Matthew because uh, Christ really deals harshly with the scribes, Pharisees, experts in the law because they need to be because they are so arrogant, so filled with themselves that they think they're going to heaven based on who and what they are, based on what they've done in life and they're not. So that's why he says this, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the experts in the law. What he's saying is the experts in the law and the Pharisees are going to hell. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that is unless you believe in Christ. 
So he's setting up, actually, from verse 520 on through about uh, 524, what it's dealing with, or 523, when we have 520 through 523, it's actually, actually, it's Jesus Christ saying, look, these scribes, these Pharisees, these experts in the law, they are sinners. And they're not going to heaven because they follow the law. So what he's doing is setting a precedence and saying that, uh, as Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. So in verse five, or chapter 5, verse 21, it deals with the mental attitude of murder. And it's dealing with mental attitude because the religious people would never think of actually murdering someone, just as probably we would never think of actually murdering someone. But when we have hatred in our heart, and when we have in our minds the idea of killing someone whom we hate, well, that is a mental attitude of murder. And that means you are still sinning. And if you don't act upon it, well, it's because you probably know the consequences. So you do not murder because you do not want to go through capital punishment or go to jail and all of that. So you just do not murder overtly. But you have the thoughts in your mind. It still makes you a sinner. And this is what Christ brings out in chapter 5, verse 21. He wants to shock the scribes, the Pharisees. He wants to shock all of the religious people into knowing that they are sinners. And they are sinners. And uh, this is how he does it, 521. You have heard that it was said to a previous generation, that would be in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, dealing with the Mosaic law. Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subjected to justice. This means they will be subjected to temporal justice, capital punishment. In the Old Testament, any time anyone committed murder, they were executed. They were stoned to death. And there was no partiality in the Mosaic Law. Whoever committed murder, if they were crazy, if they were insane, in the Mosaic Law, they didn't care. The Mosaic Law goes like this. You've committed murder. Uh, whether you, uh, well, you committed murder. If you're insane or not is not the issue. The issue is you've committed murder. You had a choice not to and you chose to. Whether you were insane or not is not an issue. You are going to go through capital punishment and be executed. And that's the way the law worked in the Old Testament. It should be the way our law works that any time anyone murders someone, takes away their freedom to live and to breathe, they too need to be executed. Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subjected to justice. That is capital punishment. Then in chapter 5, 22, But I say to you, this is Jesus Christ, and what he's about to do is shock the socks off of those Pharisees, of those experts in the law. They're experts in the law. They know that they can't go out and commit murder. They've studied the law. And they know the Ten Commandments frontwards and backwards. They could go from one to ten or ten to one. They knew them. And very, uh, they were very knowledgeable in the Mosaic Law. But uh, here is Christ still condemning them because he's saying, look, I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother. Now this anger is orgizo in the Greek. That's O-R-G-I-Z-O. O-R-G-I-Z-O. And this Greek word refers to retaliatory anger. And it actually is a mental attitude of murder. And Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 delineates that mental attitude of murder. So they think in their hearts, I wish I could murder that person. I wish I could kill that person whom I hate. And all the scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, all of them had had these thoughts before and they knew it. So it was a shock to them to hear Christ say this. And once Christ starts to step on their toes, they're going to have a mental attitude of murder against Christ himself. And eventually they will hang him on a cross from their mental attitude of murder. But I say to you that anyone who is angry 
orgizo, retaliatory anger, a mental attitude sin of anger. Anyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of being subjected to divine justice. That means they'll be subjected to divine punishment. The law cannot uh, say, hey, I know you've been hating someone, so we will prosecute you. Well, they can't look into your mind. Although there is a stupid movement today to, well, they call them hate crimes. And if you commit a crime against someone and they say, well, you hated that person when you committed the crime, you get a harsher, pen harsher penalty. That has to do with liberalism and a bunch of gobbledygook. The Word of God comes at it straight and says, look, the law can't see you as a murderer, but God does. When you have that mental attitude of wanting to murder someone else from hatred, God sees that. The law doesn't because you don't act on it. But God sees it, and this is a shock to all the Pharisees because they've acted so holy, and they've never murdered anyone. They would never think of it unless it would be a Christian. But they would never think of it at this time. I, I would never murder anybody is what they would say to themselves. And then Jesus comes along and says, Hey, I tell you what, if you think about murdering somebody, if you have hatred toward your brother, you're a murderer. That's what he's saying. You have committed a sin. And we note this because in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And no, no one is excluded from that. We've all sinned, and Jesus Christ is shocking these people, making it very clear, saying that I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of being subject, subjected to divine justice. So God sees into your hearts. He judges the intents of your heart, and so he judges you based on that. And whoever says to his brother, this is the Hebrew word, arakah, R-A-C-C-A, -C -C -A, Raqqa. And excuse my French, but this is exactly what it means. It means, you bastard! If anyone says to his brother, you bastard! And this is Raqqa, R-A-C-C-A. -C -C it's, it's a Hellenized Aramaic expletive. It's not Hebrew, sorry, it's Aramaic. It's an Aramaic expletive. And this was their form of cussing. And it would be roughly equivalent to uh, us saying, you son of a bitch or you bastard. And so, uh, if you say this, remember uh, Jesus Christ is addressing the Jews. He's not addressing us. And he's addressing the Jews as they are to live in the millennium. And it, it, whoever says to his brother, you bastard, will be in danger of being brought before the court. Now, this is an expression of a mental attitude sin. When you call someone a bastard, it's an expression of your hatred toward them. Uh, you don't just call someone a bastard for the heck of it. You're mad at them. You're angry with them. You probably want them to die. And you say, you bastard, or you son of a bitch. And that is actually what Raqqa means. And it's saying you will be in danger of being uh, brought to justice because you've had this mental attitude sin, and now you're having verbal sins by uh, expressing what's in your mind through the tongue. Then it goes on to say, and whoever calls a believer fool. That's what it says in uh, most translations, fool. It actually is moron. Well, they, what they're doing, they're calling you a moron. Why? If anyone calls... A believer, a moron. It's dealing with a people who believed in Christ. And why are they being called morons? Because they've, uh, well, they're proclaiming the gospel of Christ. So uh, here they are. You're a believer in Christ. Let's say you go out and witness to someone and say, look, Jesus Christ died as a substitute on the cross for you. All you have to do is believe in Christ and be saved. And then if they say to you, you moron, well, guess what? You will be in danger of a fiery hell. Anyone who calls a believer moron or fool for proclaiming Christ as the Savior will be in danger of being sent to fiery hell. Now, why are they in danger? Because when they're calling you a moron for proclaiming the gospel, they're expressing their unbelief. They're saying, I don't believe you, moron. You're just a moron. You believe that junk? 
That's, a, that's ridiculous. Believe in Christ and be saved. Never heard of that. That's stupid. You're an idiot. And so they, well, they make fun of you and ridicule you and call you a moron or a fool. Well, they're in danger of hellfire because they haven't believed in Christ. And that's all that verse means. It doesn't mean that if you're playing around with your friend on the computer or on uh, the PlayStation 2 and he were to kick a field goal and it makes you mad because you, uh, you are going behind in the football game and then you say, you fool! It doesn't mean you're going to hell. It, it's a complete different... It, the reference, you must put it in context and the context is people are calling you moron because you're c proclaiming Christ as Savior. And you're not going to go to hell because you uh, kid around with your friend and call him a fool or call them a bastard or anything else. It's not going to result in hell. You see, it has to do with mental attitude. What is your mental attitude toward Christ? Do you believe in Christ? If you do, you're not going to call someone proclaiming Christ a fool or a moron. So it doesn't apply to you. It only applies to unbelievers who think that the message of the gospel is foolish. Chapter 5, verse 23. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, and what does this deal with, bringing a gift to the altar? So if you sin, are you going to have to start bringing gifts to an altar? What altar? Well, what are you supposed to do? Remember, it's for a different age. Jesus Christ is talking to the age of Israel. He, there is no church there's not even a thought of a church, really, except Jesus Christ knows that there will be one. But right now, he's dealing with Israel. No one knows that there will be a church in the future. So what he's saying is, uh, and uh, what he's saying is uh, from this, so then, if you bring your gift to the altar, the altar was the system of worship in the age of Israel. This is what they did in Israel. We aren't to do that today. We don't bring gifts to an altar. In fact, we don't cry at an altar for salvation. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, part of the function of the Old Testament spiritual life, and there remember an act of mental attitude sin against a brother. You see, uh, you go to the altar to worship. That's what they did in Israel. And so you're going to the altar to worship, and then while you're there, suddenly it pops into your mind, and you remember that you had hatred against your brother. There's someone in your periphery whom you hate, someone whom you've had a mental attitude sin against. So worship is meaningless when you're in carnality. What this is saying is, look, uh, you're out of fellowship. You're coming to the altar, and you have a sin of hatred in your life. You're going to the altar as a member of the uh, Israeli nation. You're going to the altar as a member of the Jewish race and you're a Judaizer and you've believed in Christ, but uh, you're still functioning under the age of Israel. So you go to the altar as they've always done. And then you remember as you uh, bow down at the altar or whatever you're placing at the altar, you remember that you've sinned against your brother through hatred. And the brother remains anyone in your periphery. And you've sinned against them Oh, by having a mental attitude sin. So you remember that, and actually you've sinned against God, and so you are out of fellowship. So what? this is Christ telling the Israelis what to do, those who are Israelites. He's saying, all right, uh, you go to the altar as they've always been doing. He's just teaching them just as if uh, their, uh, you, their type of spiritual life would continue. And he was offering it to them as if it would continue, even though it doesn't. So he says, all right, your spiritual life is going to continue. What should you do if you kneel down at the altar, give your gift, and then have a mental attitude sin? What you should do is in 524, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be transformed. Corrected translation. Go and be transformed. Now, how would that person uh, be transformed? By rebound. When you name your sins to God or acknowledge your sins to God, oh, well, you've had a change of mind about your sins and you've said, yes, I was wrong. I named them to you. And then, uh, if you are wise, you do not commit that sin until you are tempted again and do it again. Uh, but what you do is say, uh, you say, oops, I forgot to rebound. This is all it means. I went to the altar and I had, and I was going to worship the Lord at the altar, and then I remembered I have sin in my life, a mental attitude sin. 
So now I must rebound. So go and be transformed. Go rebound. And then come present your gift. In other words, be in fellowship. If you're not in fellowship, your gift's not going to mean a thing. And the same is true in the unique spiritual life. If you go to church and you listen to the Word of God and you're not in fellowship, you're not going to learn a thing. Nothing. And the same is true here. When you go to worship, when you go to a worship service, when you go to church, make sure that you've rebounded so that you can get benefit from the message. If you don't, there's no benefit because you're living in sin and in carnality. Now, most churches don't teach this, and most churches, whether you're carnal or spiritual, you're still not going to learn anything. But that's because they haven't studied the Word of God as they should have. Instead, they've been busy visiting people in hospitals. Well, those people in the hospital would be just fine if you had taught them the Word of God, but now they can't handle it because you've been a fool as a pastor. So, then in chapter 5, verse 25, have a rapid, relaxed mental attitude. This is the corrected translation. Have a rapid, relaxed mental attitude. This is from the Greek word agape. Agape, remember there are two Greek words for love. One is phileo, that's a personal love. The next is agape, impersonal love. So have a rapid, relaxed mental attitude from having the equivalent of impersonal love toward your adversary. And what is that noise out there? Uh, toward your adversary. And your adversary is, uh, well, your enemy, the one whom has been antag antagonizing you. Have a rapid, relaxed mental attitude from agape toward your adversary while he is expressing hostility toward you. So during this time, he's expressing hostility toward you. And during this time, anyone includes the enemy. Uh, and at that time, the enemy could buy uh, another one's uh, banker's note. Uh, let's say that uh, you are having financial problems. And what this is what Christ brings out, and this is what he means. You're having financial problems. Someone is expressing hostility toward you. Well, back then, if you were to have your enemy take your banker's note, and if you did not repay that note to your enemy, you would be thrown in jail, uh, just as it was in Great Britain. If you could not repay something and you went into debt, well, they didn't bother with bankruptcy. That was just unheard of. There's no such thing as bankruptcy. Uh, what you would do is uh, the person would say, uh, this person has not paid back my loan. Send them to jail, and they would go to jail. It was part of breaking the law back then. Today, it is uh, much uh, more lenient, and you can thank God for that because uh, many people today, if they had those laws today, about half the country or more would be in jail today, and that would destroy the economy in itself. But this is how they functioned back then. And so uh, what it's saying is uh, you must have a relaxed mental attitude toward your adversary because, well, uh, they may have just went and bought your banker's note and you're going to have to pay them. And if you don't pay them, they're going to send you to jail. But if you have a relaxed mental attitude toward them from agape, have impersonal love toward them, then they will not hand you over to the judge. And the judge would be, or the judge, or to the warden. And you will... Uh, not and you will uh, not be thrown into prison if you uh, function under agape. That's because uh, you will not antagonize their anger towards you. Uh, they'll still probably be angry and wish that you had paid them on time and all of those things, uh, but uh, they won't hand you over to the judge and you will not be thrown into prison because you have had agape. You've, you're living your spiritual life. And then he goes on in 526. I tell you the truth. Now, of course, if you uh, do not, actually, I skipped the last half of 525. And what this is saying is if you do not function under agape, if you do not function under uh, impersonal love, if you do not have a relaxed mental attitude, you will be thrown into prison because they will react to you. You react to them, they react to you. The best thing to do is not react at all. Just to leave it all in the Lord's hands and have a relaxed mental attitude. But if you don't, you will be thrown into prison. Then in chapter 5, verse 26, I tell you the truth, you will not get out 
until you have paid the last quadrant. And the quadrant here is a Roman copper coin. And it's worth a little over today by today's terms. And it might be worth a little more by now because of inflation. But it's worth a little over uh, 30 cents. That is a quadrant. It's worth about 30 cents. And uh, 1 64th of a denarius, you'll read denarius in Matthew, and that's a day's wages. 1 64th of a denarius, that's how much most people got paid in a day. So I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last quadrant. Well, you've reacted to their hatred, and you have gone in for sin. And you have had hatred back toward them, a retaliatory, a retaliation type of anger. They made you angry and said, uh, you need to pay up, buddy, you bum. And so you react to them. And then because of that, you'll be thrown into prison. Now remember, we're dealing with those ages. We're dealing with the age of Israel. And if you were to function in that manner in the age of Israel, you'd be thrown in jail. Now today, if you get a phone call uh, from a collection agency and they say, uh, you owe us um, $5,000 in hospital bills, and then you react in anger, which would be sin, but you react and say, you go to hell, I'm not paying it. Well, you're not going to go to jail for that. It's not part of our law. So we have to always distinguish in Scripture of who who is the audience? The audience is Israel. And this is exactly what would happen if they didn't function under impersonal love or a form of it from agape. Now in 527, uh, Christ changes subjects uh, from uh, this to adultery. And now Christ is going to talk about adultery. And he's going to really uh, slap the faces of those scribes, Pharisees, and Hypocrites. 527. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. So beginning off, he states a point, a true point. Do not commit adultery. That is part of the Ten Commandments. You have heard that it was said in the Ten Commandments, do not commit adultery. Then in 528. But I say to you, for your benefit is actually how it should be translated. It's for their benefit. But I say to you for your benefit that whoever checks out a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That is in the frontal lobe. In other words, you can uh, sin. You can commit mental adultery by simply looking at a woman and lusting for her. And you can look at a woman who is fully dressed, fully clothed. You can look at a woman in the Walmart, fully dressed and fully clothed. And you can take her into your mind and do whatever you want with her. That's mental adultery. It is sin. So he's shocking all of the legalists. Because the legalists, all the people who think they're so holy... Uh, they've gone around their whole life bragging because they have followed the command not to commit adultery. And so they've been walking around, I've never committed adultery. And they see someone else commit adultery and they say, stone that person, they've committed adultery. But then when it comes to themselves, well, they don't even think about themselves. So Christ comes along and says, hey, if you've even thought about it, you've just the same, well, not just the same, but you have sinned and you've committed mental adultery and that's what Christ was saying to them and so they're all shocked because they all of a sudden realize they're sinners all this time they were thinking they were so great so what does, what does this do it steps all over their toes suddenly they're oh, how dare he say that about me a mental adulterer well that's what they were and he's making it very clear to them and this shows how ridiculous legalism is because if you go to some churches like the Wesleyans, they'll say, uh, you can't go and swim with the other teenage girls. If the guys, the teenage guys swim with the teenage girls, they say, it might make you have a, a sexual thought about them. Uh, guess what? They could be fully clothed. Uh, they could be wearing uh, the little bonnet that they wear in that stupid religion. And they could be wearing a dress down to here. And the dude could still undress her in her mind. He could still do it, and he could still sin, and this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, 
You are a sinner, people. You're all sinners. And you think you're so great because you've never committed adultery. I say to you, if you've thought about it, you have sinned. And so, but the legalists, they, well, they're kind of weird, actually. They're kind of like perverts because every time you get around them, it seems like the only thing they think about is sexual sin. Because uh, you can't swim with the girls because you might have a sexual thought. And that's what they're thinking. Well, they're projecting onto you what they would do. And they're saying to themselves, oh, I know I would have a sexual thought. We can't let the young people do that and swim with the uh, other young ladies or they'll have a sexual thought. Well, they're always doing it. That's the point. They're the real perverts. And this is what Christ is bringing out. Hey, uh, you brag all the time because uh, you have never overtly committed adultery but you've done it in your mind. And that's what he's telling them. And they are just shocked. And they don't like to hear that because they know it's true. I mean, for the first time, somebody has picked their brain and said, you're an adulterer. You're not perfect. And uh, most of them, uh, most of these people who uh, uh, think in terms of, uh, well, if uh, the, the young lady dresses this way, then all the men will lust for her and she's a slut. Well, these same people would have to get a little bottomy before they would stop lusting about other women. But they, you see, it's hidden. Nobody can look into their brain and know when they're lusting for uh, women. And nobody can look into their brain and know when they are committing mental adultery with a woman. So it really just rips them to shreds. And this is why Jesus brings it out. And, and he's sitting there talking to them. Uh, yeah, uh, you've heard the commandment, don't commit adultery. He's kind of being sarcastic. Of course they've heard it. They brag about never committing adultery. And then he smacks them down. If you've thought about it, you're a sinner. That's what he says. And then in chapter 5, verse 29, and our Lord continues to get more shocking. Uh, this verse here, it's not literal. Please do not read this, these that come later, and take it literally. It's not literal. We do not um, uh, t pluck out our own eyeballs. That's ridiculous. It's not literal. It is, this is what we'll get to. It's not a literal thing. It is a figure of speech in which he's shocking the audience. He's, he's telling the audience, uh, well, he's trying to wake them up, and we'll see that. Chapter 5, verse 29. And this is the corrected translation. Your translation probably says, since your eye. Well, this is dealing with uh, your dominant eye, and in which you uh, look with your eye at a woman and then have a mental attitude sin of adultery with her. Since your dominant eye, the mental attitude sin, causes you to have a mental attitude sin, you see, he, he's, he's shocking right now. He's trying to be shocking by uh, uh, making uh, this point. It's not literal. It's, it, it's a shock. It's a type of a wake-up call. And what he's saying is, uh, well, your eye is not the source of sin. You can know that from common sense. And you say, yeah, but I did look at a girl and lust for her. Well, your eye wasn't the source of sin. Uh, the source of your sin is in your sin nature, in which actually the source of your sin, when you sin, you choose to sin. When you sin, it's a volitional issue. It has nothing to do with your eyeball. But Jesus Christ is trying to be shocking. So he says... Uh, so he says this, but you have to understand your eye is not the source of sin. You're tempted from your old sin nature. And plucking out your eyeball will not stop you from sinning. Now, and you might be struggling with that right now, but if you've ever seen the movie Ray, guess what? Ray Charles was blind, but he lusted after uh, more women than a lot of people with sight do. So he, his eyeball didn't cause him to lust, and he committed adultery. And he slept with uh, every beautiful woman he could find. He would just touch them, though. He couldn't see, so he would touch their arms. And if they had a good feel to them, well, he'd lusted after them. So uh, Ray Charles was blind, so his eye did not cause him to sin. Well, he has an old sin nature. If you're blind, you have an old sin nature. And Christ is only saying this to shock the legalist, Because uh, they've always thought that uh, if they could hide their sins from the public view, if they could uh, just uh, uh, be sophisticated about their sin, they would never commit real adultery, but they'll think about it. And so if they think about it, nobody's going to know if they're thinking about it. And they can do this in their own privacy. Nobody will ever know. And so they can still continue to put on the front of holiness, but they're not holy. And Christ brings this out and makes it very clear. 
So again, 529, since your dominant I and, and you have a mental attitude sin uh, because causes you to have a mental attitude sin, tear it out and throw it away. Now that's just shocking. You see, uh, just imagine a bunch of religious people uh, sitting in front of me today. And they have always bragged about how they have uh, never committed adultery. And they brag about how they follow the Mosaic Law to a T, which is what they did back then. They, I've never stolen anything. I have uh, never committed adultery. I have uh, never committed murder. I've never done any of this. So Christ brings out two things. He says, yeah, you've never committed murder, but you thought about it and you're a sinner. And then he says, yeah, you've never overtly committed adultery, but you've thought about it, so you're a sinner. So he's bringing out their thoughts and it just burns them up. They can't handle this uh, type of teaching. They've never heard it before. And then when he says, tear it out and throw it away, it's shocking. And so they're... Oh tear my eye out and throw it and they would all start to think I'm going to have to tear my eye out and throw it away <laughs> because I've sinned well so has everyone sinned and then, so you can see how it would step on people's toes tear it out and throw it away this is an analogy however and if they had any sense about them they would recognize the analogy the analogy is self judgment and how do you judge yourself rebound the analogy is for you to name your sin to God, to rebound. He's saying, look, you've committed a sin of mental adultery. Name it. Rebound. That is the analogy of plucking the eye out. Well, you've named your sin to God. And so you're forgiven when you name your sin to God. Tearing it out and throwing it away, it's like naming your sin and disregarding it. It's just an analogy a very harsh analogy, especially for them, and it's not literal. If it were literal, no one on the earth today would uh, have sight. We would all be blind, and, uh, and uh, we would all go without hands, as we'll see later. So it doesn't have to do with, uh, it's, not an, it's, it's an analogy, it's not real. And as some people might take it literally, and that would be very stupid. And then it goes on to say, it is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Once again, it is better to lose one of your members, that is, it's better to be blind, than to have your whole body thrown into hell. And you say, well, what's this mean? If I sin, I'm going to hell? No, uh, this is simply, this is common sense. Of course it's better to be maimed than to go to hell. That's all he's saying. And Christ is saying, hey, it's better to be maimed than to go to hell. Of course it is. Because you're maimed for however long. You live on the earth, you die if you're a believer, and you go to heaven. Well, of course it's better to be maimed than to go to hell. Now, if you were to take this literally, what you would say is, I must be maimed to go to heaven. And that's ridiculous. Self-mutilation is not part of salvation. And we don't pluck out our eyes to get into heaven. And that's not what Christ is saying. It's an analogy. It's a figure of speech. It's almost like sarcasm. And people are so literal, they get stupid about it. And they don't even know that Christ is just being a great orator. He's just getting up being an orator saying, uh, it's better if you just pluck out your eye than to go to hell. Well, of course it is. He's stating an obvious. He's not saying, you don't see anything in there that says, if you pluck out your eye, you will go to heaven. Nothing there about that. And so people look at this in their ignorance and not knowing the basics of even English language and drama. Jesus Christ is simply being dramatic. He's saying, uh, pluck out your eye and throw it away. Rebound. It's just a dramatic way to explain rebound. And then, isn't it better uh, for you to be maimed than to go to hell? Well, just imagine, you have to understand the audience. There are definitely some people there who are religious sitting in front of him. And so uh, they've suddenly realized, because he's been so tough, that they're sinners. All this time they thought they were perfect by following the Mosaic Law. And now he brings up that, hey, you can think about it and be a sinner, and you're a sinner for thinking about it. And so they're shocked. I am a sinner. So then he even shocks them more. Well, pluck your eyeballs out. It's 
better to pluck your eye out than to go to hell. What he's saying is, look, you religious people, you are going to hell. And there's nothing you can do about it except to believe in me. And he brings this out later. So he is really, really laying it on thick. And uh, they know it. It's hard for us to pick up in the English until it's explained to us. But they knew what was going on and they were very insulted. And some of them may have, however, believed in Christ because they would have walked away saying, you know what, I am a sinner. I thought I was great. And, and one of the first steps is for somebody in self-righteousness to say, you know what, I'm really no damn good. I do need a Savior. So what he's trying to tell them is, you need me. You need Jesus Christ. Not me, but Jesus Christ. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. So he really makes that point clear. And then in chapter 5, verse 30, he brings out something else. Now he's just dealt with mental attitude sins. Now in chapter 5, verse 30, he is going to logically deal with an overt sin. And of course, uh, people commit overt sins. He doesn't elaborate so much on the overt sins because they're obvious. If somebody commits adultery, it's usually obvious. It, it's hard to keep hidden most of the time. And then when they do it, usually it leaks out. It's pretty obvious that somebody's an adulterer. And it's pretty obvious that somebody murders someone. It's an overt sin, not a mental sin. Mental sins are very easy to hide because they're all within your skull and nobody can crack your skull open and see what you're thinking. So there's no way. So he makes a, a short verse, a little short thing on overt sins. Since your right hand causes you to sin, now he's dealing with the hand, not the eyeball. And the hand, well, it, it is, it's a reference to overt. It's overt sin. Since your right hand causes you to sin overtly, cut it off and throw it away. Same reference to rebound, except he's still being shocking. And so he has shocked the legalist, and now he's taking his turn at the antinomian. And you should remember the difference between legalism and antinomian. The antinomian uh, usually commits the overt sins, fornication, adultery, drunkenness, drug abuse, those things. Uh, they go out for the pleasure in life. And they're the antinomian. They're still sinners. It's a different category. And then the legalist, well, he had to go from uh, 527 through 530 to talk about legalists to wake them up. But since when you commit an overt sin, it's so obvious, he uses one verse just to bring it out and say, uh, by the way, for you antinomians sitting here, you two are sinners. And if you commit an overt sin, then uh, cut off your hand. Well, he's just being balanced uh, in the uh, discussion. Since your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Definitely not literal. He's being shocking. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go to hell. In other words, it's better to go without a hand than to be in hell. Of course, that's true. But he's not saying, cut off your hand to get into heaven. There is no statement here where, the, where it says, if you cut off your hand when you sin, with that hand you will go into heaven. No, uh, that is a ridiculous thought. Uh, but what it's saying is, uh, it's better to uh, have one hand instead of two, and go into heaven. Or it's better to have one hand instead of two than it is to burn in hell. He's just, he's just illustrating something uh, dealing with sin. That all of us are sinners. He's making it clear because so many people think they get into heaven by suddenly becoming perfect or by suddenly becoming good. And you're never good enough. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteous needs are as filthy garments. And in the Hebrew it says, they're as menstrual rags. And that's a shocking statement. But that's what it says in the Hebrew to wake people up. And every time in the Bible when it deals with religious people, it's tough on them. It says, oh, you're saved because you're good. <laughs> that's what you think. Your righteousness is as menstrual rags. Very tough. Or uh, you think you're saved because you've never committed adultery. Well, you think about it, so pluck out your eyeball. It's just Christ being very, uh, well, he wasn't uh, a lot of pictures that we see of Christ, which are artist renditions. Now, they make him look very sweet and very pious. But if you were to actually hear uh, Christ, well, he was very tough. 
And he would come down hard on uh, everyone because we all need it. We're all sinners. And then uh, right now he's just revealing the fact everyone's a sinner. And then, of course, he does give the solution to that, which is to believe in him. And we'll get to those verses. But right now, uh, this was uh, documented uh, by Matthew because, well, it impressed him. It impressed him when Jesus uh, was being so tough and when Jesus was uh, really lambasting a lot of people. And he loved it, and he wrote it down and talked about it. Uh, but we can't be stupid when interpreting these things. And then in chapter 5, verse 31, it switches from the topic of adultery to the topic of divorce. And we will study what adultery is all about. And then uh, I don't think we'll study what divorce is all about yet until we get to another passage in Matthew that deals specifically with divorce. So then in chapter 5, 31, it, it was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a legal document. And that's true. You see, uh, he's still uh, chewing people out at this point. He's just switched subjects. And the chewing out is not going to be as harsh, but he's just switched subjects because we have to understand the context. During those days in Israel, uh, they could get a divorce very, very easily. Simply have a legal document. Uh, if a man were to marry a woman, and then the man got tired of her, and uh, she was too much of a nag, he would just uh, sign a divorce paper and it would be final. No reason, really, uh, kind of like today in our country. If you want a divorce, incompatibility. All right, uh, wait three months and have a divorce. It, it was even easier then. And just sign a legal document and you're done and you're divorced. And so uh, some of these uh, Pharisees and these hypocrites had been involved in this. And just uh, uh, they get tired of someone, divorce them, go with someone else. So it was said, so now he's about to step on some more people's toes. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a legal document. And that is what was said in the Mosaic Law. But he expounds on it and says, But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the grounds of adultery, that's dealing with immorality, except on the grounds of adultery, causes her to receive adultery. Now, what does this mean? Well, when a, uh, when a man marries a woman, he is taking her as his property. I know the feminist wouldn't like to hear that today, but that's the way it has been and the way Scripture describes it. When a man marries a woman, it's his, it's his property, and he owns the woman. It's his, or she is his. And so, if suddenly he just says, I, I divorce her, well, by law in that day, he could have said, I just divorce you. And she would go on her way. And he would be divorced to her. And in the meantime, she would meet another man. And if that man were to marry her, as in have sexual relations with her, he's committed adultery. Because uh, legally, in God's eyes, she's still married to the first husband. Because there was uh, no, well, if there is no uh, sexual act, of deviance involved in which one of the other uh, commits adultery, the, the binds of marriage still exist. So what you can do is leave. It's like separation. It's the difference between separation and divorce. When you're separated with somebody with whom you've been married and you separate from them, you still cannot legally have sex with someone else. And so uh, when uh, the husband, who doesn't like the wife, says, I divorce you, and yet there's been no adultery, they are still, well, they're separated legally, but she can't go and remarry without uh, causing uh, the other man, actually, the man who marries her, to commit adultery. But what happens then, and you say, well, that sounds crazy. Is it a constant adultery? No, what happens is uh, they get married, and then... Uh, she has not yet uh, had sex with anyone else, neither has her former husband. But she gets married now because she thinks she's, uh, well, she's legally divorced in the sight of the law, but she's uh, not in the sight of God. So when she commits adultery, this time with the uh, new man she's married, it's a one-time thing because when you commit adultery, it dissolves the bounds of marriage. 
So uh, she would commit adultery, and then, well, that's a one-time event. And then any other uh, sexual intercourse after that would be in the confounds of marriage. I heard one idiot pastor uh, say an adulterous marriage. That's impossible. Uh, when the uh, marriage is consummated, if she has not, uh, if the other person in her life has not committed adultery and she has not committed adultery, uh, then yes, that would be the one act. That's the way the law uh, brings it out, God's law. I know it's uh, confusing and uh, convoluted right now, but when we get to the subject of divorce, uh, you'll really start to understand what it's all about. Because remember, in, in the Mosaic Law, our culture would definitely have a hard time understanding it, being that divorce and everything else is so prevalent. But uh, when this uh, law was first given, when the man married a woman, that woman was his. It was just as if he purchased a car. If you go out to a car lot and buy a car, it's yours. And then, uh, uh, let's say you uh, neglect that car and you just leave it in your backyard. You don't even have any use for it. And that would be a reason for divorce, by the way, but not a reason to remarry. A reason to divorce if you've been uh, neglected or if you have been abandoned. Let's say the guy abandons the car in his backyard. It's still his, he's just abandoned it. And that is a reason for divorce. So the woman could say, I've been abandoned, I don't have anything else to do, I want a divorce. So legally she could get a divorce and go separately, but she does not have the right of remarriage. And so it's just as if uh, the uh, idiot has a nice car in the backyard that he will not use, that he has disregarded. And then if somebody comes down the street and steals that car, well, that person's going to jail for grand larceny, for grand theft auto. And that is what he would go to jail for, uh, whether he was using the car or not. And, and this is about the best way I can bring uh, this uh, subject into this, because what Jesus says, But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the grounds of adultery, causes her to receive adultery. That means when she remarries... Uh, she is still technically owned by her first husband because there was no adultery on the first husband's part. So he didn't commit adultery. He just got tired of her and got rid of her. And, and maybe he was a weirdo and, and didn't like sex and was never going to do it again. And so he got rid of the wife. And, but he never went and committed adultery, so she's still bound to him in that she can't have sex with someone else. So long as the first husband has not committed adultery. And anyone who marries a woman who has been divorced, that is, if, uh, if there's a divorced woman who got divorced for any reason other than adultery, if she got divorced because he was a drunk, if she got divorced because he was, uh, well, she didn't like his personality, if she got divorced for any other reason besides adultery, and there are a few others, there are a few others. Actually, I led you astray a bit on abandonment, but we'll study divorce in detail. Uh, but there are uh, several reasons for it, but the, the main reason Christ brings out here is adultery. And, and anyone who marries a woman who has been divorced commits adultery. So if uh, uh, you go out and find a woman who's been divorced, and, uh, she, and you say, well, uh, why were you divorced? And she says, I was divorced because uh, we were incompatible. He was nothing but a drunk. You know, well, did he ever cheat on you? I don't know, probably not, but I didn't like him and I'm divorced from him. If you were to marry her, that would be one act of adultery when you had sex with her. Uh, because, and then once the adultery occurs, the other marriage is dissolved. It sounds difficult. Uh, because our culture is so messed up today, if you lived then, you would understand exactly what the Lord was saying. Now, what is adultery? Uh, we'll get some points on what is adultery. We'll get some points on uh, tomorrow on the prohibitions of adultery. We'll talk again about mental adultery, abnormal sex, the phallic cult and their reversionism, homosexuality, bestiality, pimping, rape, and other forms of abnormal sex. And we'll talk about fornication. And then we'll talk about adultery again as being a bona fide reason to divorce. If you're married and your spouse uh, commits adultery, uh, you can get divorced and remarried. And there's no thought about it. I mean, there's, it's not sin. And uh, when someone commits the, uh, 
adultery, it's almost as if uh, that spouse is dead to you because in death you can remarry and when they commit adultery, you can remarry. Other than that, there are a few other specific things we will study under divorce in which you can uh, get a divorce and remarry, uh, but we'll study that in detail later. Now, adultery is defined as this. Adultery is the voluntary act of sexual intercourse of a married person with someone other than his or her lawful spouse. Adultery is the voluntary act of sexual intercourse. And you say, sexual intercourse, does that mean just uh, penetration? No! I, I mean, uh, well, I'm not going to go into that. There are young people here. But there are, uh, adultery includes, uh, uh, just as fornication, includes anything that would be considered sexual act. That I can't describe to you, uh, just so you know, I guess I can, we're old enough here. If you uh, do something besides intercourse, such as oral sex, if you have oral sex, that's fornication if you're both unmarried. If one is married and you're unmarried, if uh, you're unmarried and you go to a woman's house who's married and have oral sex, that is adultery. You can't get around it like uh, some presidents have in the past and say, it was oral sex, it's not the same. It is the same. It's exactly the same. And uh, it's not holding hands, people. Come on now, and we got to have some common sense. And neither would be uh, any type of uh, manual eroticism. That would be using the hands. Well, that's fornication too, if you do it. And you say, but it's not intercourse. So what? It's not holding hands, as I said. It's sex. A sex is sex is sex. A spade is a spade. And that's what it is. So you cannot uh, justify yourself in those things. So, uh, continuing, adultery is the voluntary act of sex uh, between a married person with someone other than his or her lawful spouse. Adultery refers to sexual activity outside of the divine institution of marriage. And again, Adam and Eve set the precedence. Marriage was designed for one man and one woman, for Adam and Eve. And as I've heard it said, not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve. It's for Adam and Eve. No one in, uh, in that relationship is one man and one woman. And you say, but David had ten wives. Yes, he did. It was part of the culture, but he was wrong, and he suffered for it too. So you can't have uh, more than one wife. The precedent was set in the garden. One man for one woman. Now, then you say to yourself, and you get inquisitive and say, well, Adam and Eve had children. Who did the children have sex with? Well, they're brothers and sisters. But this, that was a different time. That was a, uh, this was before, incest is a sin, by the way, today. But at that time, it wasn't classified as a sin because uh, the human race needed to procreate. And so remember, if you've been reading dispensations or you know dispensations, and God has a different plan for each age. And incest wasn't included as sin uh, when Adam and Eve were created. And then they had children. And then the children had uh, sex with each other. I know it sounds gross, especially for anyone who has ever had a brother or sister. It sounds gross. Uh, but it, that's the way it occurred then. And then later, once the earth was populated, a God set down the law, no incest. So that's why today, if uh, uh, people have incest, they have retarded children. Uh, the, the genes don't match up, and all types of terrible things occur if uh, there is incest too close in the family, a cousin with cousin, a sister with a brother. And then you will end up with retarded children and a bunch of uh, defects, really, a lot of defects. And uh, a lot of the kings of the past realized that because they would intermarry in the family to try to keep their property and all of that. And they would end up with retarded children or a lot of miscarriages in which they could never really have children. Well, they didn't function under the way God wanted them to function. So we'll study in detail uh, adultery and divorce because uh, Christ is bringing this out. And I don't think I did a good job of explaining it this first time around, but wait till tomorrow and I'll explain it better. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, uh, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And we pray for our president that you will uh, 
continue to give him wisdom in his job in uh, protecting uh, the United States through military victory. And uh, may you continue to shield us from the evil of the terrorists. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.